Welcome everyone. We will get started in two minutes. While we're waiting, feel free to share in the chat box where you are joining us from today, whether it's your hometown or a location, that would be great to know. All right. Marilyn is in the house. <laughs> we have some New Haveners. Yay, New York City. Okay, so thank you everyone and welcome to the Asian American Cultural Center and Association of Asian American Yale Alumni's third jointly hosted virtual event. This, so this virtual event series came about as a result um, of a desire to create opportunities for intergenerational dialogue about the systemic inequities and social conditions that allowed for the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Tony McDade, and many other innocent Black lives, which took place over the summer in the midst of a pandemic. It is our hope that today's panel will inspire and encourage all of us to begin and or continue engaging in the necessary work of anti-racism. We are so glad that you could join us this evening. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Joliana Yi. I use she, her, her pronouns, and I am the Assistant Dean of Yale College and the Director of the Asian American Cultural Center, which I'm excited to say will be turning 40 in 2021. In an effort to make, the visible, um, to make visible the often invisible, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the lands on which we are settled upon today. We are coming from many places today and we want to acknowledge the ancestral homelands and traditional territories of indigenous peoples who have been here since time immemorial and to recognize that we must continue to build our solidarity and kinship with the native peoples across the Americas and across the globe. The Yale Asian American Cultural Center is based in New Haven, Connecticut, and we acknowledge the Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Skatikok, Golden Hill Pakasit, Niantic, and the Quinnipiac and other Algonquin speaking peoples. We also acknowledge that the country would not exist if it wasn't for the free and slave labor of black people. We honor the legacy of the African diaspora and black life, knowledge, and skills stolen due to violence and white supremacy. And while the movement for justice and liberation is building, we are witnessing the power of the people but many are still being met with violence and even being killed. So collectively, we are unequivocally saying Black Lives Matter, and this needs to end now. But we thank you for showing up for your community and for yourselves today. Uh, I want to take a quick uh, minute to just go over a few guidelines for today's conversation. You'll notice that you're all muted and your videos are obviously turned off due to the webinar mode our event is taking place today. Uh, but, you know, as the panel is underway, we encourage you to kind of engage with one another in the chat, as I just encouraged at the beginning of this event, but, you know, keep it focused as much on the con content being discussed today. Um, and then, you know, as the panel is underway, we invite you to also submit your questions that you might have um, using the Q&A feature that is next to the chat box. And then uh, myself and our moderator today 
um, will draw kind of from those questions for the second half of our event. Without further ado, it is my honor to introduce today's distinguished panel moderator, Professor Daniel Martinez Hosang, tenured professor um, of ethnicity, race and migration and American studies, and also holds a secondary appointment in the Department of Political Science. A member of the AACC Advisory Board and a professor much loved by so many here at Yale, I will now pass the virtual mic to him. Oh, thank you so much, Dini. Um, thank you for those uh, really um, uh, appropriate uh, comments that you opened up uh, us up with. Um, a big thanks to ACC and the AAYA for all your work in organizing tonight's session. And thank you to everyone um, for joining us. I'm going to introduce our fantastic panel in a moment and just share a few uh, framing comments that might help us engage um, what we'll hear. Uh, racial and ethnic identities and the groups that organize around them often face a really complex contradiction. On the one hand, the very notion of a group identity like Asian American suggests a similarity or commonality among those who identify with it or inhabit it. But on the other hand, um, we all know such identities are never rooted in a single experience or perspective. Uh, some of this can vary by the other forces that shape all of our lives, our gender, our sexuality, religion, language, citizenship, class, etc. But um, there's differences that lie in other areas as well. The way we see the world, the way we understand power, domination and resistance, our experiences in the world with work, with money, um, with uh, access to opportunities. Um, whether we seek to embrace or challenge or affirm existing forms of authority, uh, who we see as friends and kin. So this is uh, what we might call our politics, our ideology. And we really don't talk too often about the different currents that shape the many, many different worldviews of people who call themselves Asian American. So tonight we have three wonderful panelists to help us think about these questions of politics, and political difference and organizing and worldview within and among Asian Americans um, and how uh, we see ourselves in relation to other minoritized groups, uh, particularly as Dean Yee talked about in relation to black life in this country um, and the tremendous crisis we're facing. We wanna make clear that our discussion is not a debate about politics, uh, policy, or morality. Uh, we trust that everyone listening also brings diverse and sometimes conflicting views and commitments. The point here is not to reach uh, some kind of singular consensus, some kind of unity, but to explore the ways that political ideas and ideology organize our very lives, our hopes, our desires, and our actions. So now I'm gonna to turn to our great panelists. We're gonna begin with Janelle Wong, a professor of American studies and a core faculty member in Asian American Studies at the University of Maryland. Janelle is a graduate of Yale's PhD program. She received her degree in 2001. She's an expert in political behavior and attitudes as they relate to race, religion, and ethnicity. She's the author of many books, including most recently, Immigrants, Evangelicals, and Politics in an Era of Demographic Change that looks at questions of religious identification and how it shapes uh, Asian Americans' political uh, identifications. Um, she was a co-principal investigator on a 2060 national uh, Asian American survey, a really important innovative survey that produced um, all of this really um, critical data that formed the basis for many, many um, reports and uh, uh, scholarships. And I just should also add that um, Professor Wong is not only a leading expert in these fields, but she's lent that expertise to many organizing and advocacy campaigns, including support for affirmative action, voting rights, and other racial justice issues. I think she's on sabbatical now, and it shows her generosity to our community that she's willing to share her time with us. She's mentored countless undergraduate and graduate students, and I'm proud to count myself in that group. Um, and she's given really generously her time, so uh, we're really happy to have her. Um, we'll then turn to Odette Wang, who graduated in 2020 as a sociology major and an education studies scholar. Odette's from the California Bay Area. She's done extensive policy research in the area of public education and bilingual education. Her senior essay, which we're going to hear a lot more about soon, was titled Two Truths, Asian American Ideological Orientations in the New York City School uh, Diversity Debate. It was based on uh, 17 interviews with parent activists where she was really trying to think about how does it come to be 
that Asian American community leaders support and um, embrace particular ideologies and rationales. Finally, Lakshmi Amin is a senior in Brantford College, uh, majoring in ethnicity, race, and migration. She hails from Southern Ohio. She brings experience working in community-based arts groups, including Art Space in New Haven, and this summer served as a community organizing fellow at New York Citizen Action. Um, at Yale, she was centrally involved in an effort we'll hear a lot more about to bring attention to the Citizenship Amendment Act, or CAA, passed by the Indian government in late 2019. So we have this wonderful inter intergenerational panel. I want to thank you all uh, for being here. And Professor Wong, if we can turn to you to start. Uh, much of your research has focused on the broad political preferences and behavior of a wide range of Asian Americans, including Asian American voters. Uh, more recently, you've examined some of the preferences, attitudes, and support as they relate to issues like affirmative action, racial data collection, and other uh, race-based issues. So we're hoping you could start us off by giving us an overview of that work. What does the universe of Asian American voters and their preferences look like, and how can we better understand it from that kind of bird's eye view? So welcome, Janelle. Thank you so much, Professor Hotang, and it is just thrilling to be here. I see a lot of um, participants on the chat that I've been engaged with on, on shared political work, including Dean Yi, is, that's how I met Dean Yi, and then I'll just have to tell of you that I, uh, when I first had Professor Hotang in class, I went home that night and thought, should I have that graduate student teach the class? Because he really knows a lot. And so you're all benefiting from that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share a screen that has some new data on the Asian American vote here. So it's really great to be here with all of you. And also um, thanks to the organization sponsoring this event. I'm going to talk about some political trends because we just got these data in uh, last week and I really want to share them with you um, and talk about their implications for how we as communities address racism. So these data are mostly based on a recent survey that included six different Asian American groups. These interviews were done in three different Asian languages and uh, via telephone and online with registered voters. So, Many of you know that Asian Americans have been moving towards uh, democratic partisanship. We're starting to actually see that there are, I think, maybe more Democrats than even nonpartisans. That is kind of a new trend in our community. And you can see here that the only group that is identifying as more Republican than Democrat are Vietnamese. And that's because early on during the first waves of migration from Vietnam, uh, the the uh, Republican Party was associated with the most uh, anti-communist stance. And so those loyalties to the Republican Party really stem from, uh, in some ways, international relations. Some of you might be curious, what does the Asian American vote look like this coming fall? And again, these are just registered voters and they are weighted to look like the population. And you can see here, the, that overall 54%. So if you look at the capitalized letters, you see Asian American. Um, Asian Americans are more likely to support Biden than Trump, but we have also seen a, like a two, three percentage point tick up over time in support for Trump that is pretty steady. And so I do think this is really a result of partisanship to some extent. We also see these splits. Again, the only community that is supporting uh, Trump over Biden are Vietnamese. And that is again, mainly I think due to partisanship, not due to Trump as a candidate or as the president. Another thing you'll see here, South Asian Indians tend to be the most uh, democratic leaning and the most progressive on most issues as well. Okay, I'll, I'm gonna get to the uh, heart of the matter soon, but I just wanted to bring this up that, is there an Asian American political agenda? Yes, but I would say you have to look beyond the stereotype. So there's a lot of discussion about our differences um, and parties are like, oh, you're the model minority. We'll talk about education, that must be your issue. Or, oh, everyone is uh, an immigrant in your community. Let's talk about immigration. In truth, Asian Americans don't look particularly different when it comes to those two issues. Um, they look kind of like the general population. 
In fact, my recent research shows that Black Americans are actually more progressive on both legal and undocumented immigration policies than Asian Americans, even though Asian Americans are a majority immigrant community and Black Americans obviously are not. We also might have to look beyond the headlines. So if you look at the headlines related to Asian American politics, you see a lot of things that look like this. These first generation Chinese Americans are vigorously opposing sanctuary laws. I see some Maryland folks on the chat. And in fact, Chinese American immigrants successfully killed a sanctuary status bill for the state of Maryland. Um, there's been a ton of, as you know, uh, attention to Asian Americans, especially Chinese Americans opposing affirmative action. And then as Professor Hosang mentioned, there has also been attention to a move by mostly Chinese Americans to protest the disaggregation of national origin data for fears that it might reveal uh, there might be uh, some lift that data disaggregation will actually lift up these inequalities within our community and lead to some kind of discrimination against the more advantaged groups in our community. But don't believe the headlines. So where, what are the issues on which Asian Americans actually are distinct from other Americans? One is healthcare. So Asian Americans are much more likely to support universal healthcare. They love Obamacare um, compared to the general US population. You can see some variation here, but wow, Asian Americans really think healthcare is important. Government spending. So this really distinguishes white from non-white voters across the board. We see that Asian Americans are more likely to support a bigger government with more services than a smaller government with fewer services. And that's true for all non-white groups. The only group that doesn't say this, who thinks a smaller government with fewer services is more preferable are white voters. Gun control, this chart says it all. Asian Americans are gun control voters, much more likely to support stricter gun control than other Americans. Asian Americans are environmentalists. So you see very, very strong support for environmental. I mean, if you look at this question carefully, it's the government stepping in to address climate change and global warming, not just concern with recycling, but actually government intervention. So Asian Americans are actually big government voters. On the other hand, you see a pathway to citizenship for undocumented immigrants. Asian Americans look almost exactly like the US population more generally. They are not more uh, progressive as a whole. So this is an area where we actually don't look particularly progressive. What does that matter? Well, let's take another look at some other data. So those, those areas where there are consensus, there's consensus in the Asian American community are areas that are sort of like race adjacent. They all have to do with race, but they don't directly address racial discrimination. Here we see the level at which Asian Americans of different national origins believe that there is discrimination against black people in the US. So you can see some variation here. At least 60%, almost 70%, 80%, sorry, believe that there's at least some discrimination against black Americans. But they also say there's a very high degree of discrimination against other groups. However, this is the group that they think faces the most discrimination. In terms of support for reallocating police funds to other kinds of uh, community priorities, you see here that actually Asian Americans are much more likely as a group to support reallocation than to disagree with reallocation. So this is an area where Asian Americans aren't going to get much attention, but you can see that there actually is a fair amount of support. There's also a lot of people who say they don't know or they, they're not sure in this area. So this is an area where there can be some education about what it means to reallocate police funds. Affirmative action. Despite the headlines, this was shocking to me. Asian Americans support affirmative action. And this was ask, asking, asking directly about access to higher education. 
you do see that Chinese, as we have seen for the last 10 years, have been the least likely to support affirmative action of all the national origin groups, but still this group is more likely to support than to oppose. I just did a survey of Chinese Americans in the suburbs and we see that that group is split with, with the US born still strongly supportive and the, the, those born outside the US being more split. What do Asian, young Asian Americans care about? I'm gonna have to wrap it up, I'm gonna go quickly. Younger Asian Americans are more likely to place priority on immigration and the environment and racism and police reform. So we're seeing some generational splits. Uh, I will skip that. They are more democratic, they're more progressive, as you know. So in terms of affirmative action, younger Asian Americans are even more supportive of affirmative action than the Asian American population as a whole, which is very supportive. They are more supportive of shifting funding from law enforcement agencies to other agencies. So you can see 68% of those 18 to 34 support reallocation versus lower proportions of the general older population. They're more familiar and support Black Lives Matter at higher rates. So you can see 70% of those 18 to 34 support Black Lives Matter. The, that number does shrink among the oldest, the, the oldest cohort. So you see 40% of those 50 and older support Black Lives Matter. Notice that there's a big chunk of people who haven't heard of the movement. So I'll end with this, that we do see a generational divide on race in the Asian American community, but I don't think we should draw the conclusion that older Asian Americans or first generation Asian Americans are all hyper conservative when it comes to race. Yes, we do see anti-Black attitudes across the Asian American community. They are more prevalent among those who are older and first generation, but the older and first generation Asian American cohorts are actually still more progressive than whites of that same generation and even whites more generally. So 41% of all American voters disapprove of Black Lives Matter. 34% of Asian Americans over 50 disapprove. So there's still a gap, a racial gap between the oldest Asian Americans and the general American population and older Asian Americans are more progressive. I'll end it there. Um, thanks so much, Professor Wong. That's just so extraordinarily helpful in giving us this kind of overview of uh, very, very complex trends. And, and again, to reinforce, this is data that's just coming out. I want to just ask one follow-up question before we turn to our other panelists. You know, you've said before that sometimes there's some notion that Asian Americans, that they're simply being used, who do oppose uh, affirmative action, let's say, as just kind of props and that it actually is, um, if you unpeel that, there's no kind of sentiment behind it. But some of what you're asking us to think about is that even though, uh, you know, across the board, uh, opinion is quite favorable to affirmative action, there seems to be a, a quite vocal and active and well-organized kind of community against it. Could you just talk a little bit about your work and to help us understand that dynamic, how both they're in the kind of numerical minority and yet um, they're, not, they're not simply just being manipulated by someone else? Yeah, that's, that I think is a really important question that there, you know, I think the, the progressive uh, Asian American activists were pretty surprised when uh, Asian Americans became the face challenging affirmative action. And there was a lot of assumptions, there were a lot of assumptions that this, these uh, groups were just being funded by Republicans, that um, they were being used as a wedge and being used. But um, I work with others like Oyam Poon, where we've actually had a lot of interaction with people who are on the ground mobilizing is that that's not quite the right assumption to make. But in fact, those who are opposing affirmative action have actually organized a really powerful grassroots um, organization and they have agency and they're using it. And they're using it they're in the same ways that let's say the Tea Party had used their agency or that others had. So what we see is a lot of strategic um, work being done to challenge racial equality that is really done, not even, it's, it's not even very well funded. It is actually being funded by hyper-passionate people 
who really care about that particular issue. And they are not, uh, they're not just pawns. They actually are developing their own agenda. And that agenda, I think, is a real challenge to the larger and broader Rainbow Coalition going forward. Um, thanks so much. We already have some questions coming in. We encourage uh, uh, listeners to put your questions on the chat or in the Q&A. Um, lots for us to think about there. And it's a great time to turn to Odette. Um, since your uh, senior thesis in sociology examined the ways that some of these very parents that Professor Wong is talking about, Asian Americans, organized in response to changes in New York City's uh, specialized high school admissions tests. And this is the test that determines admissions to schools like Stuyvesant, Bronx, High School of Science, and others. And other steps that the uh, New York Board of Education was taking to address long-standing patterns of inequality and segregation in the school system. So, Odette, could you just start off by talking about, just quickly about what some of those policy changes were that were animating the parents you talked to, um, and just the research you conducted and what you found? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, thanks so much for having me. And um, thank you, Professor Wong, for that really insightful presentation. I think it's always easy to lose sight of the broader context. And um, just it's good to keep in mind, especially when um, talking about the findings from my thesis as well. Um, so I, like Professor Hosang said, I interviewed 17 Asian American just generally, I classified them as community leaders and members in New York City um, on the broad issue of school diversity. So I think the most high profile case of that is the specialized high schools admissions exam, which um, Mayor Bill de Blasio actually proposed in 2018 to eliminate. Um, and this was kind of given a lot of news coverage, but school diversity and integration efforts in New York City have been going on for quite a while. Um, and some of the lower profile policy changes include, you know, getting rid of school admissions in District 15 in Brooklyn, for example, or a similar policy in District 28 in Queens. Um, there's also been a school diversity task force that has proposed eliminating gifted and talented programs entirely, um, as those have been criticized for perpetuating segregation in schools as well. So um, even though the specialized high schools has really been centered in the debate, there is um, a lot of other uh, policy and you know, the context is a lot broader than just that. So when I interviewed these people, I was really interested in investigating how those, you know, the issue of affirmative action um, at large translated to like a public, a public school, um, a high school context in a local district. And the city serves over 1.1 million students. So it is a large district to be one of the most segregated in the country. Um, and a lot of activists and advocates have really criticized the system for, um, and specifically their system of school choice and school admissions for creating that type of environment. So my interview subjects I divided into two camps. One of them was the leaders of Asian serving community based organizations in the city. Um, and the others were leaders of the grassroots movement to keep the specialized high schools admissions tests and other um, and oppose other diversity measures. So what was really interesting and kind of relates back to what Professor Hosang said in the beginning is that they all identified as Asian, they all had at least a bachelor's degree. They even had varying political views from self-identifying as conservative to self-identifying as liberal um, or just anywhere in between. But, um, and it was true that the majority of the pro SHSAT, um, that's the admissions test activists that I interviewed were Chinese and a lot of them were first generation immigrants, but not all of them. Um, so, Within this diverse group, the results were definitely quite complicated and nuanced. Um, but to summarize some of the most interesting findings in the context of this panel and what we're talking about today, a lot of the discourse that both groups employed echoed broader narratives of race in this country. So many of the pro SHSAT groups employed a narrative of what we call racial scapegoating, which essentially means like feeling used, personally targeted or discriminated against as Asian Americans. Um, 
and used especially by the New York City Department of Education to achieve their own political goals of being seen as more progressive um, and appeasing integration activists who they saw as having a lot of power in the city. So language that um, they used in my interviews were calling the diversity policies, quote, racist, quote, targeting Asians, and um, all of this was in the context of wanting to protect a merit-based system. What um, a lot of the research around merit-based language, though, has shown is that it's been critiqued by scholars, by some scholars, as a discourse that perpetuates like a racial ideology because we live in an imperfect system. Um, I think also what's important to parse out here is that many of them did consider themselves to have liberal views, to have anti-racist views, and to be um, supportive of diversity overall, but just opposing the way that um, what they believed was a fair system was it being attacked. So I think, yeah, the issue is nuanced. Um, one of the other interesting parts of my study was that I found that these individuals did still experience a racialized identity, um, even as they were advocating against these diversity measures that would increase enrollment for other racial groups like black and Latino students who make up the majority of the district. So they described being shunned at town halls, not let into buildings during meetings, a lack of translation services at public events and having difficulty getting press coverage of their movement. So even the community based organization leaders, many of whom supported increasing school diversity felt that the initial proposal to eliminate the SHSAT by the mayor completely shut out the Asian community's voice. So the argument there is, you know, maybe this would not have been the case if the opponents to these policies were white um, and maybe they would have been listened to. And so there's a layer of the stereotype that Asians are quiet or obedient or invisible. Um, but as Professor Wong mentioned, there is I think, broad support in the Asian American community for affirmative action, but recent press has really chosen to focus on this smaller but louder group um, among Asians who oppose it. And in that portrayal, they often miss, um, you know, the racism or the minority status of Asian Americans and equate them to whiteness. So I think to conclude, um, it is very layered, but yeah, I mean, I'm excited to talk about it more. Thanks so much, Odette. I mean, what I just want to say, this is such an important compliment to Professor Wong's research, which, you know, gives us these broader trends. And you're really, you were there with parents. And, and I think we really get the sense of like, this very open ended way that people are trying to figure out to make sense of their world, what gives their kids opportunities, what um, stands as a barrier to them, and the kind of synthesis. So, some, you know, some mentions of this are like kind of, um, silent majority from the like 60s, like white George Wallace discourse, we're being shutted out, you're listening to the louder minorities, but others, as you say, talk about a vision of a kind of diverse and inclusive society. So uh, there's a lot, lot happening there. I guess just a very quick question before we turn to Lakshmi, what surprised you the most? You sat down with people, you heard them talk about their lives, what they wanted. What surprised you the most among uh, parents who are trying to navigate these uh, dynamics? Definitely, so I think, really what surprised me was that their motivations, especially as parents, were varied. Like most of them had a personal stake in the issue. They had kids in the school system that they wanted a chance at getting into the top schools, but some of them didn't. And most had conservative beliefs, but some of them didn't. Um, and some were alumni of these specialized schools. They really had you know, a connection to them and the system that they went through, but some weren't. And so I think you know, what really bonds these groups, as Professor Hosing said, is ideology. It's the way that, you know, they believe that things should be merit-based, they should be fair. Um, and they also see the mayor and chancellor's actions as actively anti-Asian, not just, um, you know, promoting pro progressive agenda, but discriminating and sacrificing the Asian community in the, in, um, in the process. And so, yeah, that is definitely what I learned from this. Great. Okay. Um, thanks, Odette. We, and we look forward, you know, in, in, in the 
conversation we'll have which follows, also learning more about your work specifically with youth organizations to think about um, how young people, students themselves imagine these issues and what they might do in response to it. So th um, th uh, thank you for that. I wanna turn now to um, Lakshmi and again, we have some questions coming in. We'll open those up in a moment, but Lakshmi, I wanna ask you, so last year you were among a group of um, South Asian American students at many college campuses, including Yale, who developed an open letter uh, that circulated widely condemning the Citizenship Amendment Act uh, passed by the Modi government in late 2019 um, and engaged in a lot of publication, uh, public education work to um, try to pressure Congress, the US Congress to pass a resolution um, that, that did the same. So the letter found considerable support among organized groups uh, in many campuses, many organizations, but it also faced opposition among some South Asian Americans. So could you briefly just talk for a little bit maybe about the CAA, some of the organizing that students did in response, and really what you found um, and what you learned about this question we're engaging with here about um, differences in orientation and politics and, and views, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, so just a little bit about, of background about the CAA. Um, it was passed in December of 2019, actually after a considerable amount of pushback for a while the hashtag was reject CAB which was a bill and then it became an act um, and under the guise of protecting religious minorities in surrounding South Asian countries the act which would be paired with the national population register um, was part of attempts to strip Muslims of Indian citizenship or prevent them from being able to become citizens in the first place um, and shape India into a Hindu nation um, which is very much part of a longer and broader Hindu fascist hold um, is not something that began with the CAA. Um, and following that, protests erupted across India and, and across the diaspora as well. Um, and especially in India, most of these uh, protests and shows of, resi of resistance were led by Muslim women. One of the most famous ones was um, the sit-in at Shaheen Bagh, which actually began a couple of days after the CAA was passed and only ended in March because of the onset of the pandemic. Um, and it was also led by quite a few students and young people who continue to be incarcerated and, and detained by the police in India. Um, and the response from the diaspora, as I mentioned, was swift. Both, both like isolated and coordinated protests happened across the world. Um, and I actually remember that a few days after the CAA was passed, Harvard and Oxford students were among kind of the first at major universities to plan demonstrations. Um, but the silence was also deafening. Um, there's quite a bit of and there was also just like counter information, um, misinformation and hate speech being sp spread through WhatsApp groups um, and like emboldened Hindu fascist groups in the diaspora were kind of like reignited. Um, and so I guess within this landscape, um, Students Against the Bus specifically developed um, to plan a series of protests to be held in March of 2020 across campuses, um, in addition to planning teach-ins and movie screenings. Um, and I think in the end, we had about 20 campuses participating, um, both in the US and elsewhere. Um, and we also tried to have a number of conversations about the best way to go about doing this work, um, not just claiming uh, or stating solidarity with the movement in India, but figuring out how to do that um, in terms of, in ways that would actually help them, um, which is something I think we're still trying to figure out. Um, we actually we also use social media to spread the word and amplify materials that collectives in India were already developing. Um, and we also were lucky to have the support of more established South Asian American organizing groups. Um, and particularly those of us who come from Savarnar caste privileged Hindu families, we're starting discussions within our own families, student organizations and communities, um, which are long overdue. Uh, and I guess in terms of the long-term impact we wanted to have, we were thinking about um, the ways that the BJP or the ruling Hindu fascist party in India doesn't just use the South Asian diaspora um, for, monetary, for monetary support, but also for ideological support. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about Professor Wong's point about how like we tend to um, think that maybe, organ we tend to attach a certain kind of politics to the term organizing or activism, whereas it's really not true because um, the the kind of um, Hindu fascist network in the diaspora has has organized their base extremely efficiently. Um, even right now, I'm also thinking about like Odette's point about how people who um, the, there's kind of a range uh, of this like political spectrum, and there are like Democratic Congress people who are BJP supporters. Um, former presidential candidate candidate Susi Gabbard has close ties to the Modi regime. Um, and Joe Biden's AAPI outreach coordinator um, has ties to Hindutva as well. 
um, in addition to like the universities that many of us students um, attended. So it's really, this is definitely baked into um, upper caste diaspora cultural and political sphere. Um, but at the same time, we have to, uh, as we as in like upper caste um, Hindu people in the diaspora, we're thinking about how we're also building on a long tradition of South Asian American organizing um, spearheaded primarily by working class Muslim and Dalit or caste oppressed communities um, and thinking about how we can bring a base of university students um, from backgrounds of privilege together as well in support of those movements. Um, I'm also thinking about uh, Professor Wong's point about like looking past the headlines um, because I'm not sure, I some people might be familiar with the Howdy Modi rally that happened in Houston. Um, I think Hudson Minhaj also filmed a video. We went and confronted people there. Um, but I actually found out from one of my friends who is a wonderful South Asian American organizer that a group called Azad Austin um, mobilized super quickly right after that event was announced to um, bring thousands of people out to protest that same event. And I don't remember that protest getting as much coverage as the event itself. Um, and then lastly, I think we're just also thinking about how to use the momentum from this campaign to encourage um, and ourselves and others um, to actively support other movements, including the one for Black liberation, um, and just generally disrupt trends of complacency and inaction, um, particularly within uh, up, upper caste uh, Hindu communities here, um, and figure out how we can best support the Muslim and Dalit organizers who've been doing this work for much longer than we have. Well, th thanks so much, Lakshmi, for that really just careful account of what happened. I'm just curious just to ask you, and I, again, I want to invite um, people to um, share your questions in the chat and in the Q&A for all of our panelists. Um, I, I think, you know, on the one hand, you described a set of very well organized people who um, like identify with longstanding currents who are not really the object of your kind of public education and persuasion campaigns. You knew they would be opposed to you. But you also described a set of colleagues, friends, professors, people in your lives, people who, you know, you have attachments to, who you respect, who also um, had differences around this. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about that, you know, maybe what uh, surprised you about that and uh, the kinds of responses that you um, came to like cultivate um, to, to try to um, maybe uh, bring people in to the, the kind of analysis and way of being you're describing. Yeah, I think, well, I think maybe just on like a broader level, the pushback we got was like, it, ran it was such a range because it was family members, it was Twitter trolls, it was organized campaigns that were designed specifically to counter ours, like with websites and everything. So like, there was sophisticated pushback. Um, and I think in terms of like, speaking with university administration, a lot of it was um, figuring out how to navigate uh, claims that we were Hindu phobic, um, which is a fairly common Thing that has been leveraged against us is the idea that like we are spreading hate against Hindu communities, um, which that claim in itself is like Islamophobic and is trying to distract from Islamophobia and the violence of Hindu fascism. Um, but I think just in terms of like my personal, uh, just like discussions I've had with people, my friends, my family members, um, the backlash or like, I guess the, it was a little bit expected. Um, but I found that like something that was helpful was to think about myself and how I came to this work because this is something that I would never have thought to get involved with if not for the students around me and us coming together. So um, it was helpful for me to think about ways to bridge like the personal with the more structural and, the, and um, I guess the broader themes. Um, so that was just a way that I was able to start conversations with students around me. And like one, one example from my life is that um, my last name, Amin, some, a myth that I grew up with was the Muslim invasion myth, which is very common and is, is used to um, kind of uh, assert India as belonging only to Hindus. And I was told growing up that my last name was given to us by like Muslim invaders. And it's not our real last name and that they were just there for a short time. But now India is back in Hindu hands and everything's fine. So that was just like one, that was a starting point in my life. And I found it helpful when talking to my um, like Hindu classmates um, to start with the personal and go from there. But yeah, there's, a, there's also a lot more to be said about the other um, <laughs> backlash we got, but that was just, those personal conversations were difficult, but I think were helpful ultimately. Well, actually, I just, I really appreciate that because you're also, you're casting it not just in a kind of, you know, 
you know, terms of morality, like some people have the correct and other people, but also acknowledging the ways people are socialized in many different ways to embrace ideas, ideas that can be, you know, uh, cause violence to others without um, reflecting on that. And then, you know, all the labor that goes into trying to stage those conversations. So um, thanks for that. We, I'm going to uh, offer, a, um, just pull out a couple of the questions from the chat uh, before we do one last round. So um, Professor Wang, there's a whole range of questions about some of the data that you engage and some of them we answered in the Q&A, but could you just speak a little bit more maybe to how a lot of the data that you shared are disaggregated by um, national origin and ethnicity, but what are some of the other factors that tend to shape why people might embrace, some people might embrace affirmative action, other people might not? Yeah, uh, I'll keep it quick because uh, I see some other questions in the chat, but I want to just make it clear that there, the data that we collected are disaggregated on the link that I shared, which is at the uh, AAPI data site. And we disaggregate the data not only by national origin, but by age, by geography, um, by swing state. And so all of these things, some matter less than others. So if we look at gender, gender is not one of the huge driving factors, but we are seeing a little bit of a gender gap with regard to the Trump vote, for instance, um, age, is and uh, nativity are the two big uh, things, big uh, splits in the Asian American population. And again, that has to be contextualized to some extent. Thank you, Janelle. And so I just urge people to uh, go look um, and explore other aspects of that data. Um, Odette, I want to just uh, turn to you. Um, uh, there's a question about kind of the, the, you know, in some ways it's like the competing proposals and visions and solutions that might address. Uh, the clearly deep-seated levels of inequality and often failure in, in the public schools and the kind of debate over focusing on a small number of schools versus trying to engage a broad, broad kind of school transformation strategy. So how did that come up in your interviews? Um, and maybe you could also use this time to talk about some of the work you did with the youth groups and uh, the solutions that students saw maybe in response to some of these uh, debates. Sure, yeah. So I see this question about, um, you know, why focus on a couple schools, whereas it, as opposed to like fixing the system at large. Um, and I think that most people, regardless of their positions on school diversity or school integration or specialized high schools in New York City, would agree with you that there should be a focus on uplifting all schools in the system and remedying it from that root as opposed to focusing on specialized high schools. I think a couple of things that came up in my interviews with people was that one, the conversation, the conversation isn't just focused on specialized high schools, it is broader. There are smaller movements among different districts in New York City to um, remedy integration at large within districts. And two, um, the point about, I think, race being a core issue of why the New York City school system is so segregated and broken is that um, really addressing diversity and integration would address the root of the problem, which is a problem of race. And I think that is definitely the um, most controversial point um, between you know people who believe that diversity should be a priority and diversity shouldn't. I don't think anyone is opposed to having schools be more diverse. I think it's just about how they would order it in their priority. Um, and just really briefly about the work that I did with the youth group, um, when I was starting to learn about my thesis topic, you know, I was hearing from um, my initial interviews with people in the Asian American community that yes, Asians were the one leading the school diversity opposition movement, but also that, you know, it wasn't the full picture. Like Professor Wong said, support for affirmative action is very broad, um, but that integration activists were not doing a good job of engaging Asian Americans on the side. Um, and I, that one of the primary groups in New York City that's advocating for school integration is called Integrate NYC, their youth-led group. And so I met with them and talked a little bit more about how Asian Americans could better be engaged in this movement. Um, and so I worked with them to design a curriculum for high school American, for high school Asian American identifying students to think about questions of race and identity. Um, and 
the goal wasn't to convince them one way or another. It was more just to, you know, ask them to reflect on their own experiences and observations, kind of like we're doing right now. Um, and that was the work there. Great. Thank you for that, Odette. And uh, Dean, you um, put the link to integrate New York City um, uh, in the chat as well. Um, let's turn to a, a question now for Lakshmi. Um, uh, asking you to think about um, some of your experiences um, in terms of where you, um, the, the effort received pushback, where it was embraced, what you noticed in terms of, um, like did that vary by age, by other kinds of factors? Um, uh, so yeah, it's kind of uh, applying some of the, the bigger um, findings in Professor Wong's uh, research to um, how this kind of played out in your, uh, in your experience. Yeah, that's a really great question. I should have mentioned that earlier. Um, I think at the beginning of this work, I was very much expecting most of the pushback to come from um, older generations. But I actually, over the course of like some of the research we've been doing, particularly into like youth education groups in the diaspora, um, there are a lot of young people who are also invested in Hindu fascism. Um, and that was something that was a little bit difficult for me at the beginning. I think I, I had been like somewhat conscious of it because I think I've grown up in a lot of those spaces as well. Um, but I, I was surprised that like those conversations that we had were also with like a lot of young people, not just with older people. Um, again, there's definitely a stereotype that um, some of like the older generation is like extremely conservative, which is true in some cases. Um, but we had to have those discussions with people of all ages. So. Thank you. And I, I just appreciate that sentiment that, um, you know, again, kind of all of us being socialized into very different uh, ideas and histories and values are always kind of these works in motion. And what it, partly what it means is that um, our efforts can't just limit themselves to, to a, a kind of tiny subset, um, that everyone is constantly thinking about these issues. Um, as we move towards kind of wrapping up, there's a, just a question about where um, each of you see the focus on um, organizing and education, where the kind of biggest priorities, perhaps the biggest opportunities. Uh, maybe we can turn back to you, Professor Wong. A lot of your work has directly been um, in advocacy related to defending affirmative action in California before the courts. Um, what do you see on the horizon and what do you see um, uh, kind of having the most potential now? So I think I would go in two directions here. The first is around the question of affirmative action in particular. I think there's just so much misinformation about it. So the reason it has been uh, really hard to, uh, I think, have the media pick up on the fact that Asian Americans support affirmative action on the whole, and really one of the biggest challenges to, to those who don't support it is misinformation. So many people still believe that there's a quota a racial quota and that affirmative action is in fact a racial quota when uh, quotas haven't been allowed since 1978. And then second, uh, this is even more tenacious in some ways. There's widespread belief among both those who support and those who uh, oppose affirmative action, there's widespread belief that there's an Asian American penalty in college admissions where Asian Americans actually have to score higher than other Asian than other students to uh, be admitted to elite colleges. And that that narrative uh, is is wrong in my view and wrong according to research, but still continues to color the way people think about the issue in a way that's very hard to dismantle. And then finally, I'll say that you can see a huge generational divide in terms of um, all of the issues that we raised today and who's going to speak, who speaks for Asian America. So I think you know, like that, the fact that young people feel differently than older people about um, many of these issues, including Black Lives Matter, including affirmative action, it doesn't matter if young people aren't activists. So on the one hand, it's exciting for me to show that there's these splits and, um, you know, these nuances in our community. On the other hand, it's kind of sad that, you know, some, like not everyone's voice is obviously being heard in these debates. And so, Another, there's a very big gap between attitudes and action right now. Mm -hmm. And um, Professor Wong, is there just one effort? I know you you helped in, you've been helping in California, the ballot initiative that's looking to restore affirmative action there. Is there an effort that's just giving you, making you excited, you find intriguing or promising, um, you know, as we look out over the next few weeks? Yeah, I mean, I, I will just uh, 
echo Odette, like the, the fact that, that young people are driving these um, school integration movements, um, this is happening in my home district too, that young people, including Asian Americans, are actually the forces calling for redistricting that will create more equity, more racial integration. That's going to be going on, I think, even after the election. And people in this age cohort that are college and above can actually help. I have so many high schoolers calling me right now to like speak and to help them in their efforts. And so to the extent that we can support younger people who are actually doing this work on the ground, to me, that's a great place to put in um, our efforts. And so I can, I'm happy to share these kind of nascent high school groups with anyone who's interested in, in working with Great. Thank you so much, Professor Wang, and, and, and for that work as well. Um, let's just turn to you, uh, Odette, quickly. Um, I mean, I think you're working on this curriculum, um, a, a, a certain kind of anti-racist curriculum for Asian Americans is really a very uh, tangible example of it. You talked about, on the one hand, not wanting it to feel too heavy handed, like you were, you know, just issuing a set of you know, um, talking points of people, but inviting them in. Could you just say maybe a little bit more about that? Because that's a very practical um, uh, kind of application of what Professor Wong is talking about. Definitely. And I think in the context of doing this in conjunction with Integrate NYC, it was obviously biased from the start. I think that that was something that I struggled a lot with in developing the workshop initially. Um, but I think, you know, my philosophy there was really, and Integrate's philosophy, um, was that my curriculum was only for a day long workshop and you know wherever people are starting from like like uh, thinking about all these questions is a journey for most people and um it was meant to be more of a starting point than to have people come to a conclusion so it was very questions based um you know thinking of having students reflect on their own experiences what they saw in their schools maybe if their school was diverse why was it diverse if their school was not diverse, why was it not diverse? And where their beliefs about merit came from or where their beliefs about um, integration came from. And so, it, I mean, Integrate also has a lot of work that they do that was existing that I was able to build off of and a lot of other wonderful resources that I'm happy to share. But um, that I think would be the short answer. Great, thanks. That's a really, really uh, helpful way to think about it, about in that kind of open-ended way. Lakshmi, can we just turn to you, um, just to sh you know where uh, again where this was not uh, the uh, you described the challenges you face, the opposition you face, but where were areas that made you feel excited, hopeful, um, thinking about new possibilities for the future? Yeah, I think for the future, the two things that stand out most to me are just like continuing to work on base building um, because that's something that we've been really conscious of is we don't want to be a small group of like specialized people doing everything we want to have as many one-on-one -on -one conversations and base build as much as we can over the next few months um, and then the second thing that's on the horizon for us is uh, really kicking off some kind of um, more uh, formalized I guess political education program which is why I'm actually I'm so excited to hear about Odette's curriculum because um, we have a few people working on uh, Hindutva 101 presentation in conjunction um, with, a, with a group at another university, um, which will hopefully enable these conversations to continue into the future and aid in building up a formidable resistance to the way that Hindutva reproduces itself through the diaspora. Um, and I, I'm, I really appreciate the idea of channeling attitudes into action because I think that that's something um, we're definitely seeing happening um, in so many South Asian American organizing communities right now. Um, and as I said earlier, like as many people, as many young people there are um, that are invested in Hindutva, there are also so many young people who are just as eager to, to trouble and disrupt that pattern. Well, thanks so much, um, Lakshmi, for sharing that. Uh, we have a couple other questions that we'll try to answer in the Q&A panel since we've reached uh, the end of our time. I just really, really want to thank um, Lakshmi Odette and Professor Wong for sharing your work with us tonight, um, the questions you raise, the uh, kind of um, uh, possibilities that you're um, uh, pointing us towards in the future, uh, just for the rich conversation you've allowed us to have together. So thank you. Uh, Dean Yi, I want to turn it just back over to you for any last uh, comments before we close. Yes, thank you, Professor Dan Hosang, and to our amazing panelists. Uh, we are so 
thankful for you. Special shout out to Kira Colbert and Sadie Goldberger, who are ASL interpreters today, working hard um, late into the evening. And we so thank you for being here to make our event accessible today. Um, a recording of today's event will be made available on our AACC YouTube channel in the next week or so. And you will also, if you attend it, um, this event will receive more details about our next event in this virtual series um, once details are finalized. So have a good night, everyone. And Thank you so much for being here and learning with us. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.